Hi there, it's me again, Mr. Wonderful, coming to you from the tumultuous world of money disputes. The stress, the bitterness, the heartache. I'm here to sweep all that baggage away by helping you find resolution. So let's do just that. I've got a video here from Dustin with a dispute, of course. Let's listen to what he has to say. Hey Kevin, my name's Dustin and I have a dispute with my business partner on a podcast that we shot. We started shooting and went from like 100 views to 1,000 views to over 2,000 views. And then we got advertisers and sponsors. And almost as soon as the money started coming in, my partner kind of got greedy and then basically tried to fire me. And uh, I told him, I was like, you can't really fire your partner. You can buy me out or compensate me for my half, but you can't really fire me. And then he just went blank on me. Now I just want to get compensated for the time and the money that I put into the business and uh, I need your help. This is a really interesting situation. What Dustin has created or co-created could be very, very valuable, but I need more information. Like, is there a contract? Is there a real partnership? So I've got him waiting on video. Dustin, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So Dustin, keep pasa hombre. What happened here? So he asked me to join the podcast just to get some traction. They couldn't get it off the ground. And so there was a, a meme of me and, and I'm, you may have seen it, me and a girlfriend of mine at an Astros game, and it went viral multiple times with different uh, sayings and stuff. So basically the first show that I did went over 250 views and that was just organic. And he asked me to do it again. And the next show that we did, we got to about 500 views and he asked me to be his partner. And we ended up finalizing it 45-55. Now, quick question, right out of the gate, Everybody wants to know, including me, do you have a contract? Is there anything on paper or is it just two dudes with a podcast? Pretty much two guys with a podcast. There's a lot of text messages back and forth, but no, no formal contract or, or anything like that. How do you feel about that? Um, in hindsight, like a complete idiot. I'm going to try and help you, but you, when you form a business, particularly when revenue is going to come in, you need something in writing. How much money in total have you put into it so far? About $350. Is there an amount of money, a dollar amount, that if he wrote you a check and gave it to you and left your likeness there and just kept building the business that you'd be okay with? Uh, uh, $67,000. All right, Dustin, you put 350 bucks up and now you want 67,000 back? Connect the points for me. So that's based on two advertisers, one that I brought to the, company, uh, to the uh, show that, that's $400 a show to advertise with us, which is $800 a week, it's $83,000 uh, over two years, which if I was going to sell my business, I would want two years of revenues. And that's after the production fees, you know, 15,600. So that's $67,000. That's not unreasonable. You're, you're sounding pretty savvy now. I thought you might've been a little naive not to have a contract, but at least you know how to value the business. The problem is you have no leverage right now. Without a contract, it's hard to fight the legal battle and the courts are jammed up because of all the COVID stuff. And this is not big enough to get a lawyer that's a contingency player involved. It's just not enough dollars. All right, Dustin, you have an option here. You can send him a cease and desist letter, tell him to stop using your likeness and profiting from it without compensating you. You can use the leverage of that letter to show you're serious and then negotiate a settlement on what you're really owed in the equity piece of this. I think the number should be half. You know, 55, 45, you could settle for 45% of 60, 67,000 and feel pretty good about it because he did do some work too. Would you take half of that? I would. I think that's fair at this point. And lastly, maybe you just start from scratch and do it yourself and take all the ownership and control all the revenues and go where you want to with it. What about that idea? I think it's a fantastic idea. If you can build up a franchise, podcasting is the future. It's a huge aspect of digital marketing now. I think you should get behind your own podcast. Thank you so much, Kevin. Take care. I've got a question came in on the email transom from Alyssa. Let's read it. Hi, Mr. Wonderful. I work as a retoucher for an apparel company in LA, making 20 bucks an hour. My boss asked me to model for a photo shoot, so I went ahead, but I did expect to be paid as much as the agency models they use. These models are paid $1,200 for an eight hour shoot, but after three photo shoots, I still haven't been paid anything beyond my regular hourly rate, which is $20, I remember that. I enjoy modeling, but not for free. And again, I was originally hired as a retoucher. Should I not have agreed to do this in the first place? What do I do? Oy vey, what a mess. Alyssa, first of all, let me explain to everybody what a retoucher is. You're actually modifying photographs of clothes. That's a skill set. That's a talent. You're being hired, you're being paid 20 bucks an hour to do it. I get it. But you have a full-time job. 
And your boss has every right to ask you to do things as an employee. Nothing wrong with that. You know, listen, you've got a problem. You've already done three shoots and you haven't even squealed about any of it. You haven't made any noise at all. So now you're in a bit of an under-leveraged situation. Here's the answer. If you think you're worth more as a model, why don't you ask your boss for a bonus for, for saving him so much money? Ask him to give you 200 of it. Start there. Accept 100 if he'll give it to you. It's five times. It's five hours of work for you. And you're building a portfolio if you really want to pursue modeling. But I'm sorry. Your boss doesn't owe you anything. Not if you didn't bring it up, Alyssa. You got to take this up with him. Open your mouth. Start a dialogue. See where you can go. It's all about negotiating, my friend. I've got a video that came in with a rather complicated dispute from Maria. Hey Kevin, we really need your help. I run my family jewelry business uh, with my dad, an internationally acclaimed jewelry artist who's been named as one of the most innovative designers of our time. Uh, all of our jewelry is handcrafted in the heart of New York City, and we've been hit very hard with this pandemic, especially with our uh, retail partner, Neiman Marcus, declaring Chapter 11. We currently have 80% uh, of our inventory consigned with them. Uh, which amounts to uh, $200,000 uh, that we currently can't get back. Uh, we have tried to contact them and get our inventory back before they declare Chapter 11, but we're unable to. I would greatly appreciate any help and you getting back to me. Thank you. Look, this is completely unfair. You tell you why. It's $200,000. That's serious coin. And for her business, probably it means life or death. If she doesn't get that back and turn it into cash, el pronto, that's going to be a big problem. Now, there's good news here and bad news right out of the gate. The good news is that inventory is on consignment, which means Maria still owns it. It's hers. She lent it to the store until they sold it. Bad news, this thing is mired in a bankruptcy now. What usually happens in situations like this is you start making calls, nobody answers you. Nobody cares. You're one of a thousand people screaming to get your money back out of a bankruptcy. This is where I can help. One of the great things about being Mr. Wonderful is everybody returns my calls. So I picked up the phone and I called Neiman Marcus. And guess what? They returned my call. I told the nice man there exactly what happened and how Maria needed her inventory back. Because Neiman didn't own it, she did. And I also told him I want to put the two of them together to work it out. And of course, I would be checking up in a couple of days to make sure it all worked out. I want to hear the outcome of this. So do you. So I've asked Maria to come on. I've got her by video. Maria, good to see you. Look, I know 200000 is huge dollars. I get it. Tell me what would happen if we didn't get this inventory back to your business. Well, it's 80% uh, it's of our entire inventory. So uh, we would have probably been in a lot of trouble and most likely went out of business. I hate to hear that. Now, yeah. I got you set up with the right person within the big box retailer. Tell me what happened. It, it's actually incredible. They asked me for uh, all the paperwork they, and, and um, it was at my fingertips. So I uh, emailed it to them right away. And in less than a minute, uh, the uh, head of uh, jewelry got in touch with me. They apologized for not getting back to me earlier. And they said that uh, they will make it right and they will file the appropriate paperwork so that we can get our collections back within a few weeks. Well, listen, I'm really happy I could help out here. This is a wonderful outcome. You know what saved, what saved both of us here, Maria, is your meticulous record keeping. Without that, I couldn't have helped you. That was the key. You've done a great job tracking all this stuff and making sure you knew where it was. That was yeah. brilliant. I couldn't have done it without you, Kevin. Thank you. I really appreciate that, but I'm here to help. That's why I do this. We wanted to say a huge thank you to you. And if you uh, come to New York, we would love to see you at our gallery in Times Square. That's very yeah. kind. That's very kind, Maria. Anyways, thanks a lot. Yeah. I'm glad I could help. Take care. Stay healthy. Stay safe. See you soon. Thank you so much, Kevin. I have a video here from Corrales, which is an incredibly I'd call it interesting and complex case. Hello, my name is Corrales. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and an entrepreneur in Tampa, Florida. And my money dispute has to do with having $18,000 in student loans taken out of my name without my knowledge or consent. It all started freshman year of college. I had a very close family friend that I've known for a very long time offer to pay for my college as a gift. I trusted this family friend so of course I said yes, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to live on campus and to have this person's help. 
Well, fast forward a couple years, we had a huge falling out, a bad falling out with this family friend. So that's when I took over my expenses. And then I discovered that $18,000 in student loans has been taken out of my name without my consent or knowledge. My signature was forged and he took all the necessary steps so that I wouldn't be made aware of it. I attempted to contact that family friend directly through text and call and never heard from them again. So that's when I went to file a police report and then I waited for that investigation and the case was closed because it went to my betterment. So I pretty much lost hope. Um, I'm still paying these student loans. With all the balloon and interest, it's $25,000 that I'm still paying. I still owe $25,000. I don't think it's fair because I never signed up for this. Kevin, can you help me? Well, there's just so many questions to ask. I had to ask Corrales to join me. It's a crazy story. Let's bring her on. Corrales, you there? Yes, hi Kevin, how are you? Very good. Listen, I got a million questions. I got questions. Go back, tell me what happened there. I, I need to understand that. So I began college as a freshman and I had 75% of my tuition already covered um, from scholarships. I did have some extra college expenses and a close family friend said he'd take care of it. Now, when, so when, he said, when he said, I'll take care of it, you assumed gift. He's gonna give you the money. Right. Right. You know, two years go by and we have a falling out with this family friend. And so I took it upon myself to take care of my college expenses. And so I ran my first credit report <laughs> and um, I discovered that I have $18,000 in student debt. So you weren't, you weren't in arrears? No. So the original loan was eighteen, dollars and then the interest accrued up to $25,000. That's the new yeah. number. That's a serious chunk of change when you're just getting out oh, of college. Oh, and especially to a teacher. I make um, about 35000 a year, and um, it is going to take me until 2040, so another 20 years, um, for me to pay off these loans, and I would have paid 40000 2040. 2040. Whoa, we do not pay teachers enough. This is crazy. So then I went to the police. I filed a police report that, uh, you know, fraud. Like, I didn't sign up for the student loans. And the case was closed because it went to my betterment. He wasn't the beneficiary. I was. So, Corrales, I actually have the police report. Let me read it to you. This is what the detective said. I contacted an assistant state attorney in reference to this incident. He advised that the statute for identity theft states that the identity theft must have been done for fraudulent means. You are the beneficiary of this. The case of identity theft does not meet Florida state statute criteria. And there you have it. And at that point, I kind of just gave up. Um, and I've been making payments because I don't want to not pay them and then my credit be harmed. Can I ask you what you would have done? Because you only had 75% of your tuition paid for. Would you have raised the 18000 another way? I don't think I even would have taken out those loans, to be honest. And I wouldn't have lived at the dorm. I mean, I, I slum it all the time <laughs> just to uh, be well off. I wouldn't have lived at the dorm. And I would have hustled because I'm a hard worker. And that's what I did for the remaining of my college years, right? I worked and I paid for it, cash. All right, Corrales, what do you want? And what do you want me to do? Um, what I want is to not have this financial burden that I didn't sign up for. Um, I, I want to be able to focus on me a little more because obviously with a teacher's salary, like, sorry, but I just didn't sign up for this. Like I have a passion to be a teacher and I shouldn't be suffering from the decision that someone else made for me. I mean, you wouldn't be knocking on my door seven years later if this thing really wasn't bugging you. He never told you he was taking these loans out and he basically did this without any knowledge that you would now have to pay them back. That was unfair. Corrales, I'm gonna take a two-pronged approach. I've already reached out to Navient, the company that administers your loan, and they sent me back a statement. It's actually good news. Let me read it to you. We will be reaching out directly to the borrower. We take seriously any allegation of fraud and investigate fully. Talk about opening the door. <laughs> I'm liking this. But when you're dealing with such a crazy situation, you gotta figure out what are your options. So I've actually got an expert, Barry Coleman from the National Foundation of Credit Counseling. 
He's an expert on student loans. He'll tell us if there's anywhere for us to go with this. Barry, you understand the situation of this particular loan. You've seen yes. the details. My question is, because she was the beneficiary of all this, is there any way to try and remedy the situation? The one thing that's really bothering me, Barry, is by the time she finishes paying for this, She'll have paid $40,000, the majority of it in interest. It seems unfair when she didn't even know she had a loan for almost two years. What can we do? Sure, it certainly seems unfair. And um, there is a provision uh, related to federal student loans where a borrower may seek relief in these situations. And it's called discharge based on identity theft or forgeries by a third party. Now, according to the, the regulations, a borrower seeking this discharge must certify that the borrower did not sign the promissory note. Corrales, you never signed anything. You never saw this form until years later. We're clean, right? Yeah, that's what I hope because I never even knew about it. They must also certify that the borrower did not receive or benefit from the proceeds of the loan, which I know that's the case here. But in the second part, it says, with knowledge that the loan had been made without the borrower's authorization. And so I think that's a, that's a key part of that particular uh, point uh, in the law that Corrales um, appears not to have knowledge that the loan was made and it was made without her authorization. Well, there's nothing to point that she, you know, was knowledgeable about it. There's no piece of paper that's a smoking gun. Uh, yes, I would certainly encourage um, you to consider pursuing this discharge by contacting your federal loan servicer and um, taking the next steps. They have a form that you have to fill out in these situations and then based on that form and any evidence that you can provide, they will investigate it and make a determination based on that. Barry, do you mind if I connect you directly with Corrales so you guys can work a little bit more in this case? Absolutely. We'll certainly do all we can to assist you. Okay, Barry, you've opened the door. I can see the crack of light. I want to thank both of you. First, Corrales, to have the bravery to come forward and talk about this. Some people are embarrassed about things like this. They don't want them to resurface, not seven years later. They suffer in silence and pay all that interest. I guess I kind of lost hope. Then uh, I saw, you know, Kevin with money to spew and I was like, oh my goodness, maybe there's hope. And it was actually really hard for me to step out like this, uh, but I just did it. I bit the bullet and I'm like, I'm going to go for it. And, you know, I appreciate y'all being here. Change is definitely happening, I feel. And I do see the light. And Barry, the knowledge you've got gave us that little crack in the door that maybe we can go solve this situation with. So I thank you for that. It's actually a complex world. And, you know, I would like to say that uh, the NFCC, we are a national nonprofit. And, you know, we have NFCC certified student loan counselors that are able to assist with developing plans to, to help individuals take a holistic approach to addressing their student loans. Barry, thank you so much. This is just the beginning of a journey. Let's see what happens. Yes, thank you, thank you. People, this is why I do the work. Send a video to cnbc.com slash money dispute. Tell me everything you got and watch me make it happen for you. All right, I've got a dispute coming in from Ken. He sent in a video, very interesting situation. This one has leverage. I like leverage. I like it when you have a crowbar to start your dispute. Mr. Wonderful SOS Red Alert, I need your help. Uh, in September 2017, I sold my home and I signed a purchase and sale agreement for a new home to be constructed with a completion date of January 2018. I then moved my family, my wife, my two kids, and my two golden retrievers into an apartment while the home was being constructed. Um, spoiler alert, <laughs> things didn't go as planned. Um, January 2018, February, March, April, May, June, July 2018, the house was not complete. At that point, asked the builder for my $34,000 deposit to be returned to me, and plot twist, the builder said no. Since that point, in May 2019, he sold the house to someone else 
for more money than what I was even going to buy it for. So he's made out on the deal. Can you give me a strategy of how I can go about getting my $34,000 deposit back as well as I've spent more than $15,000 at this point in litigation trying to get that deposit back. Um, can you help me? You've come to the right place. Why? Because you have leverage, my friend. You have a contract, a purchase and sale agreement. You know, Ken, I'll let you in on a little fact. Most people do not read their purchase and sale agreement. It's multiple pages, it's got a lot of fine print, but in this case, you're gonna have to do that because there's several attributes that might be built into there. Like, when the home isn't delivered by a certain date, he starts paying interest on the deposits you gave him, or maybe other penalties. Also, sometimes they contemplate legal fees, like the 15,000 you've already paid. But you have to know exactly what's in that piece of paper. That is your leverage, that contract. Even he knows one day he's gonna have to write that check, so he's probably willing, and I'm talking about the builder now, to go somewhere in the middle. Let's do the quick math. You've already spent $15,000 against 34,000. That means you're gonna burn all your profits away if you continue to litigate. You've gotta get them to the table. Basically call them and say, look, I'm gonna keep going. I got a purchase and sale agreement, but it's a hassle for you and me. Let's meet for a coffee. Let's cut a deal. Music to the ears of somebody that's stuck under the leverage of a contract. You can't get away from that. That's how America runs. Instead of paying you back the 34,000, maybe you suggest 20,000, a lot less, and you'll take it now and sign away all the rest of your rights. And you walk away. Leave this headache behind you. Buy another house. Buy another dog. No, don't buy another dog. Two are enough. But you get my point. That's the solution. And the only reason you might even have this option is the contract. When trust goes away, the paper comes into play. That's what they say. <laughs> I love you've got some leverage to work with here. Good luck, my friend. Okay, we've got a dispute that was videoed in from Ben. Let's have a look at this. Hi, my name is Ben. I'm a 35-year-old electrician, uh, father of three young children and a beautiful wife. And um, basically my dispute is I started doing side work um, for my direct boss and we've been on a project, but we were gonna flip a house. It's supposed to pay me $30,000 at the end of it, It'll take about four months. And we're going on a year and a half now and um, the money amount hasn't changed. I'm afraid to bring anything up to them because in the past, um, when I've done side work with them, I did bring up the money because the same type of thing happened and it affected my pay at work and how many hours I get at work. Um, so yeah, I don't know how to handle it. Um, basically every hour, spare hour I have is spent there. I don't see my kids, um, barely see my wife and it has strained our relationship and I just, I guess I need some guidance. Ben, 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 Ben. You've come to the right place. This is a mess. You, my friend, are working for free. Now, if you want to be in a charity, that's fine, but this is not a charity. You're actually losing paid hours to go work for the guy that pays you for free at his own house. You know it's wrong. Your wife knows it's wrong. Your family knows it's wrong. It's got to be fixed. Ben, the only way that you can deal with this is come to a place in your head, and after having talked with your wife about this, that if you can't resolve this with your boss in a sit-down conversation, you are willing to walk away. People that are willing to walk away have a lot of power. It empowers you. You have to be ready to leave this ridiculous situation and what I consider an abusive relationship. Now, here's what we're gonna do. Step one. Confrontation with the boss has to be, doesn't have to be negative, it's got to be the truth. You can't keep doing this. Tell him that you want to be paid for all your hours because he basically got a good electrician for free. Count your hours that you actually did all that work at, take the same rate that you work for him at day job and apply that to what you did at the house. I'd like to know what that number is, but you have to know. If he doesn't give you any compensation at all for the work done in the private house, you can't stay there. The world is telling you to go get another job. That's exactly what's happening. So be prepared. Tell your wife your plan. You're going to go talk to him. If he says go pound sand, I think the world will treat you well because you're a nice guy and I'm going to make the assumption you're a great electrician. You just move on. Sometimes in life you got to take the risky prickly path and that's what this one is. Ben, good luck to you. I really feel for you, my friend. You're a good guy and this is just wrong.
You know, I love hearing from you about all and any financial conflict, and I want to keep hearing from you. So visit cnbc.com slash money dispute and please upload a video. I can't wait to see you. And until then, stay healthy and take care.